All right, so I know I got poetry here somewhere. I'm going to warm up back for the rest of you guys. Thank you all for coming down. Uh, I'm going to start with I want to go where the garbage men go. I want to go where the garbage men go. I want to ride uh, where the garbage men ride. It's Friday night at 8 p.m. I want to go where the garbage men go when they gear up, when they get in motion. The garbage men, uh, the garbage men cruising the city like a shooting star, like a desert consuming itself. They ate for garbage from their triceps to their toes like Columbus ate for America, like kids ate for the good humor man, like a robber emptying the cash register at a 7-Eleven aches for cash. In t-shirts and state jeans with their jaws stuck out like Ethel and Fred Burns with their heads stuck like teal steel plates and their va 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 voom the garbage men do not mind, they do not care. It's hot, it's cool, what's the difference? It's all work to them and they love to work with their leather gloves on their leather hands. They're high above the crowd and the stench of it all. It's good damn money besides, it's good damn money. Who's going to tell them different? They're tall, they're muscular. Who's going to tell them? They have good teeth, they have hair like Great gods and their language is perfect. Their muscles shiver like primitive seas. Their bones shake like javelins and the blood of centuries dries on their hands. They're as big as bear beer barrels and they love to wrestle with each other like animals on the ground. They're jackhammers of America. They are tugboats on the sound from Brooklyn to the Bronx, from trash can to sea to shining sea. I want to roll along on the rain spattered roadway. I'm perfectly serious about this. I want to go along with the garbage men, the calm, the professional, and let his fist striking against solid steel. They're polite to the mayor, and if they whistle at the pretty mama see this, it's only for show, it doesn't really mean anything, and they brush flies away from their faces. Nothing bothers them. Nothing bothers them, nothing at all. Not traffic flights, not fender benders, not bosses, not banana skins, not razor blades, not $20 bills, not a box of taco shells, and not the daily news. And when the wind uh, picks up, they shout back at the wind, and the wind gets the hell out of their way. And uh, when they wave to the driver, the truck takes off, and the traffic parts like the mountain sport for Colorado mountain men, and they ride away. Uh, and where do they go with all that garbage? <laughs> Go to the landfill, they go to the loading docks, they go to the trailer parks, they go to Whitney Gap, they go to the incinerator, they go to Staten Island, they go to Tennessee, they go to the ocean floor, they go home to their wives and mothers, their sons and daughters, to their apartments and their neat little bungalows and their neat little suburbs, and they climb out of their trucks and they pull off their clothes and they climb into their beds and they pull their wives to them and they make love to their wives properly and then uh, they go to sleep. And if they dream of home, it's not deal. No big deal. No big thing. After a while they stop dreaming and they are dead to the world uh, and their sleep is dark and perfect. As night is dark and perfect. And they are the lords of everything they survey. <laughs> Last uh, summer, I had an opportunity to visit uh, Kansas City and play it. It was the worst play in the Yankees. I think I lost that. It's a replay of Stanford. Bi belt buckles and Bibles. Johnny Chisholm wanted to clear across the high prairie selling Bibles and belt buckles. It was a long time ago. It was not a preaching man, no service. It was just that kind of like you or me trying to make his way through this lonesome world, do a service to society, and feed his family besides. But hell's bells could that boy sell. Six months into that little operation, his the sun rose and fell on Johnny Chisholm's buckles that danced from belt to belt across the high prairie to the state line in fine and stormy weather. One time he sold a half a dozen bibles to some chickens. Soon after that, there was a rebirth of faith and decent expectations in every town and crossroads in this country. And the commutation of naked souls was back on the table because, as we all know, there's only two things a man needs if he aims to please his wife and maintain his dignity. It's a belt buckle and a Bible. And anyhow, whether you agree with what John Chisholm was selling or not, it just didn't seem to pay no mind to the people of this state because a healthy dose of free enterprise and an ample supply of natural charm is all you ever seemed to need or was looking for. And ever since that boy walked out in this world, the farmers and the cattlemen, 
the bankers, and the town folk of this great land have only had two things that they can agree on, stand up for a praise on Sunday, and hang their hats on, uh, not to mention keep their britches up with <clears throat> dust stormer during the state of collection. And that is Bibles and to Lisa Wolski and also to you, friends. Actually, oh, it goes out to a lot of people here because I was walking back from the Juju Mukti Lounge one night and, uh, with Liza Wolski and uh, <coughs> she mentioned the urban bunnies which turned out to be rats running around and so I, that was the inspiration for this poem. It's called Indian Summer. Some folks hide their weaknesses. Some folks hoard their wealth. Some people commit suicide behind closed doors or spread their wings or forsake God or lesser deities. They forgive their enemies. They turn the other cheek. They bury the hatchet and they live in hope for a better day. Some folks bet on horses and they bury the bones of the dead. Some folks spread the ashes of their friends in rose bushes or toss them back into the harbor from whence they came or else the wind. Me I'm sitting on a park bench in New York City at the intersection of Blinker and 6th Avenue, November 14th, 12.43 p.m., listening to Tim Buckley sing, Get on top of me, baby, and waiting for the Cathedral of St. John the Divine to induct James Baldwin into the Poets' Corner, which means I'm watching people walk by. Young men, old men, everybody secret, everybody conspiratorial, everybody cool, and in their own uniquely American way, which is to say, <coughs> conventional. Girls holding hands or walking alone in tank tops or fur gray Eskimo boots in the sun shining in premature November. It's Indian summer. It's Indian summer. It's a parade of beautiful people sauntering by. Like perfect Frank O'Hara cruising Times Square in his lunch hour, observing preoccupied ladies and slow, swinging their arms or kissing each other like somebody kissed the top of Father Dino's concrete 1928 church. Flies buzzing in the sun, a pigeon packing at my soles, a whole new man sleeping next to me like a lump of coal, wind get fracked, and a cat in polyester, polyester underplants chuckling like no way to this pint of old granddad, and I'm thinking about Austin Mandius making it with old Lady Liberty, and I'm thinking about James Baldwin digging things in Giovanni's room, just trying to make it through what's what, discover what's going to happen next, taking another toke, inhale another breath from the Lord's sweet oxygen tank. And for all the poets who have passed on before me, who will never be inducted into the cathedral of St. John the Divine, crazy, holy, cryptic poets and wise like Scott Wanberg, Pedro Pietri, Tuli, Janine, Harold, Marty, Brandt, Taylor Mead, Oingo, Boingo, and oh, good old Samuel, and that's just to name a few. A big plaque on a marble wall may not be the point, but it would be nice, even if Pericles says we weave our legacy to the fabric of other people's lives, because we are not, all of us, quite so strong in spirit as Pericles. We our flesh is weak. Our limits are altogether limited and not the imaginary kind. When the lights go out on us, we are scared of the dark. The urban bunnies cutting in and out of garbage cans, parked cars, and baby carriages as we walk the mean streets looking for something to eat are rats. And when winter returns to this city, the north wind will howl uh, like two ghosts, making love uh, in a haunted way. Your world, George. All right. This is Zuccotti Park. You know, you know, you think that they say it's a temple, but they come back and they come back. And so, I mean, some things attain a life of their own beyond the immediate moment. And I think this is one of them. I hope so. Help us put an end to this shit. Quarter to three, hanging around City Hall Park in the pounding sun, which makes me feel dizzy. It makes me feel lucid and calm. It makes me feel weak and thinking about the square root of this dead end of life I've been leading. Just another warm day on concrete and crazy New York City in October with nothing to do but smile. When this dude walks up to me, he's wearing rabbit ears on his head and he's been listening to 
world music or messages from Mars or maybe it's news from Zuccotti Park and he's got a face like a shiny new quarter or the guy on the $10 bill. You know who that is who his history book tells us fear tyranny from below as much as he feared it from above just like any other ordinary man would do under the circumstances. I mean any ordinary man looking out for his own hide and the hides of his people so he takes off these raptors and he looks me up and down and he warns me watch out. But I mean, hey, this is New York City. The wheels keep turning. Who are you going to listen to? Whose fault is it? Who are you going to pin the blame on? Who do you exactly trust? He says, I don't know, but I, but I do know you, and I know where you've been. You were there with the little mammals when the dinosaurs went away. You were there the day Jim Crow turned over in his bilious hole and died. You were there at the Ludlow Mines. You were there at Peterloo and Kent State. You were the last man and the last chopper on the last rooftop of old Saigon. It is not too late. It is not too late. You know how it can go. There is always work to be done. Well, <laughs> well, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Maybe I do know that there's work to be done. But. <coughs> I got this part-time job. I'm teaching at the University of No Hope. I got bills to pay. So excuse the hell out of me, but leave me the fuck alone. And well, that should have been that. But so help me God, this is no lie. The next thing you know, there we were surrounded by a pack of mutts and schnauzers, meaning you know, the mayor's handpicked food squad, and judges and cops and prosecutors and Fox News commentators, all rolled up in a one. Sorry ass sons of bitches wearing self-appointed sunglasses and listening in to our conversation. Boys. You're coming with us, they say. We got the goods on you. It's something to talk to you about. Well, I could see what was coming next, so I bumped, I shoved, I dodged, and I ran shouting, Kiss my royal ass, you bastards! And if you don't mind me saying so, your retirement plans are null and void, too. Not to mention, you're fucked! They're coming for you next, and if you know what's good for you, which side of the street your bread's buttered, you'll jump on the merry-go-round with me and this crazy dude here and help us put an end to this shit once and for all. Whoa. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Right. Yeah, two minutes. Go with it. Do it. You're good. I got two minutes. Yeah, no, do whatever. Do it. What the whistle? Seven seconds. <laughs> Take your time. All right, this red right out of my son equates. Well, I, what I mean to say is that the road is straighter than this. The road was much straighter than this when I was driving unreasonably fast. It was a 57 Chrysler Imperial. You remember those? Well, yeah. cherry red, souped up, electric windows, electric top, chrome wheel, big damn fins. But no brakes, no brakes at all, man. You have to scuffle your fit along. It would take you three miles to roll if you wanted to stop. There was rocks flying everywhere. You might need a new pair of shoes. Anyway, I couldn't afford tires as my situation could say this week. It was dire, if not to say extreme. But being that it was, I could of course have gone around the corner, which is to say steal some tires second hand. But at the time I was with this Redhead of my sudden acquaintance, well positioned in town, she with a well off boyfriend, me with plenty of time on my hands, but no, it was not until at that particular morning. In fact, she had been sitting in a booth at the diner a very long time by the appearance of things. There was coffee cups, there was ashtrays for her cigarettes, she was putting hair pins into and out of her hair. Well, I struck up a conversation. It got to be this, got to be that, everything was going along pretty damn fine. Pretty damn fine between her and me when I looked at it as sure as we are sitting here today. The rain had stopped raining. The sun was out. Morning was nearly over. The cat was out of the bag. So zippity doo who was off. Both of us shot out of the barrel. And that was that. We was traveling 10 times faster than what's legal. I'm talking 35 plus 35 plus 35. And then somebody was yeah, man. I don't mean that road outside of Fort Collins. I prefer at this late stage to say it was one of them back east heading for her hometown in Kansas. She was a school teacher of good repute. That car car to be seen. The breeze was everything. Eastern Colorado was a sight to see. She was smart and with that orange sky. No, like, not like the red in her hair. It was a coppery sort of red, like Lincoln's pipe on a new shiny penny. She gave me the prettiest smile just then. The prettiest smile. Uh, 
boy, could just feel it. That car wanted to fly. We rolled out of the window. We beat to the beat on the dash. Oh, my, she said. Oh, my, my right toenail. Oh, my, I do believe it has just had an emotion. <laughs> <laughs>